Thank you very much, Oles and Shala. Everyone from Strathclyde, it's really a pleasure to present. As I was telling Oles when, when I told him I would present this paper, this is very much a work in progress, as you can see from the fact that even the title has changed from when I, uh, from the first, from when I just told him I would present it and then I'm presenting it now, it already becomes narrow in data protection enforcement gap. Uh, so any comments are welcome. It's possible that I make mistakes about EU law or things like this. So really feel free to, to say anything that you feel like that they want to say. So this paper is focused on what I think is a is an interesting puzzle. So this is a this is from November 2019. It's a bit outdated, but you can really see the rise of data protection laws around the world. Like data protection laws are, are kind of taking the world by storm. The, ex the exceptions being maybe the US and China, but even within the US, you have a lot of activity going on. And but data protection laws are really not new. Like in Europe, they've been on for a while. In some places in the US, they've been on for a while. And what you see is that they've had somewhat underwhelming results, you can say. So uh, I think it's fair to say that Directive 9546, the older EU Data Protection Directive and the Privacy Directive are widely seen as, as a failure that didn't really manage to change reality on the grounds. That's why they led to the GDPR. They are leading to other discussions now. In the US, the, the FTC, who is the main data protection regulator, has a like ridiculous budget for data protection. They have like 44% of the staff is applied to data protection. And even governmental assessments find that they lack any kind of meaningful power to have any deterrence or, or major impact. And, and it's definitely way too early to pass judgment on the GDPR and the CCPA, the GDPR being the EU law, of course, and the CCPA being the law in California. But you're already seeing uh, like some cracks in the system that are apparently showing up. So a lot, most of your authorities and activists like Max Rams and other people are, are really denouncing the GDPR enforcement system. The, the, the California law was just amended in, in November now because people believe that enforcement was very problematic. And once you look at, I tried to look at every single empirical study that I could find, if anyone knows of any study that, that is not in the paper, uh, please send it to me. And out of 14 empirical studies that tried to assess the impact of these laws on the ground, none found a meaningful impact, so zero. So most of them find like either no impact or a very small, and you see here like that, I don't know, this, I like the Sanchez studies, like 2000 really high profile websites and 92% of them were violating the law like from the very beginning. And, and even the Irish DPA did an assessment and found that 92% of the companies as well were violating the law. So it was a very, it, so this is a, this is the puzzle that I think this, this paper is trying to solve, it, and it has kind of three basic research questions. So assuming that we're coming from this world where the, the rule is, no, is like a lack of enforcement, and we're trying to increase compliance. So through what mechanisms do, do these laws, they try to uh, ensure compliance? And then basically looking for a more, bringing some international uh, industrial organization perspective, institutional economics, the idea is to say that these are very sophisticated pieces of legislation that combine market, tort liability, and regulatory enforcement as these three mechanisms to try to drive compliance on the ground. And then looking at this list, like, can we find any important gaps in how these mechanisms are designed that, that might underwhelm, that might undermine how they are implemented on the ground? And then what the paper argues is that they they kind of ignore how large are information asymmetries in data protection. And they kind of ignore how market power can also undermine enforcement in many of these markets. And then looking at this, the, the idea is to then discuss, okay, so if we look at other, other regulatory regimes that face similar problems, so look at antitrust, look at anti-corporate frauds, uh, how have they, what have they done to amend their laws to change over time to kind of improve this performance? And then I think this we'll discuss it later. I just wanted to start, I think it's interesting to start on what exactly are these information asymmetries in data protection. So this is from a Pew research from roughly a year ago that found that uh, most Americans don't have any idea that Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp. Like they don't know that this is a new fact to them. And then if this is a new fact to them, I think you wouldn't be surprised that most Americans have no idea how Facebook does advertising. Like they have no idea that they are profiled and then, then this profile is put into boxes and then they can, they didn't even know there was a function they could access that tells them this. And if they have no idea how advertising works on the internet, I think you would, wouldn't be surprised either to understand that they have no idea that federal enforcement agencies use cell phone location data to do immigration raids and things like this and to collect the border in the US. 
And they would have even less idea, for example, that the US military, like there's a lot of Muslims who download this Muslim prayer app and this Muslim prayer app gives the sales real time location of his users. And one of the buyers is the US military who uses this information to track them down and to do like, a, to follow them and to do military operations. So I think this is the kind of like, this is the gap that, that we're talking between what people understand a bit of how this ecosystem works and how this ecosystem is working. And this of course is very stylistic is just to, to, just to put this in perspective for, for those who are not that familiar with, with how this whole very complex network works. So, so moving to the paper and so, uh, we can, these data protection laws, are, as I mentioned, are very sophisticated pieces of legislation. And they have a lot of commands that have three different goals. So first, they try to make markets more effective and make markets work better. They also try to improve the tort law regime and make the tort law work better. And then if all of these fails, they, they, they create regulatory enforcement systems. They are also trying to implement and, and change the reality on the ground. So digging a little bit deeper into this, um, how are data markets in theory? So that, this whole paper started because I was actually rereading Exit Voice and Loyalty, which is an excellent, very short book by Albert Hirschman. And it's like, a, if anyone is interested in anything related to this area, I, I highly recommend that you read it if you haven't, which, because it's a, it's a brilliant analysis and it's really short indeed. And the idea here is that markets are usually the most powerful mechanism to align the preferences of companies and consumers. So by aggregating what uh, Hirschman calls exit and voice, uh, and uh, consumers can really force companies to comply with their preferences. So what is exit and voice? Like if a consumer is, is unhappy with something that companies are providing them, the consumer has two kind of strategic choices he can make. First, he can exit the market, he can go to another supplier, or he can voice a concern to the company and say like, oh, I hate this ice cream that you serve on this stall next to my house. If you don't do anything to improve it, then I'm going to change it. And once all consumers do this in an aggregate way, just, just behaving on their own lives, markets really decentralize monitoring and enforcement of consumer preferences because they make sure that the competition is going to align the preferences of companies and consumers. And in doing so, they're going to ensure an efficient allocation of resources in the economy. That's kind of the first welfare theorem in economics. And what you see is that the, both the GDPR and the CCPA, they are really designed to harness this power of markets, to promote markets as a way to ensure effective enforcement. So you have notice and consent systems that really want to make consumers well informed of what is the trade, what is the bargain they are giving with their data so that they can do exit and they can do voice. You know, that's something they can always do. And then if, if there are concerns about consumer being locked in, they have data portability requirements that allow them to switch suppliers because if they cannot really threaten to switch suppliers, markets do not really work. But um, what these laws kind of ignore, and this really is a paper about the but, is that this very large information asymmetries and concerns with market concentration uh, prevent some of these strategies from working data markets. So, uh, we know now that uh, some data markets have recurrently failed. So consumers do not read and they do not understand privacy policies and they understand even less because the privacy policies don't tell them that the US military is buying their location data real time. These data industries are incredibly complex and some forms of surveillance like the, the surveillance from the cell phone companies, they really cannot be avoided. There's nothing that you can do uh, you yourself to prevent the cell phone company from selling this data to someone else because if you're connected to the network you're being surveilled and the same thing happens if you have like an android phone for example or even an apple phone and and if consumers do not understand the terms of the trades and they cannot perceive these decreases in quality then exit and voices these strategies they are the foundation of markets will not work and markets will fail so markets will not deliver on this alignment of preferences and at the same on the same token Concentration problems also exacerbate this. If consumers cannot threaten to go to another supplier, then a monopolist has no incentive to comply with consumer preferences. He's gonna make money no matter what. And the problem here is that a lot of these markets are concentrated around one or two players, like Google Maps has a 90% share in my Maps API. So every time you're using Maps or any provider, Uber, anyone, you're kind of using Google. Same thing with search, uh, social media, has a, Facebook has a very strong grasp on social media and things like these. And what's even worse is that some backbone industries are concentrated. So if you, if you put together Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud and Microsoft, for example, these are very like, you pretty much have a, most of the internet cloud and same thing happens with maps that I just mentioned or, or even the fonts that websites use, like Google has a 90% share in the supply of fonts 
And, uh, and, and for, for a lot of these cases, just giving consumers the portability of their posts on Facebook is going to do very little to increase competition. So if we have information asymmetries and markets are, and, and, and there's market power, a lot of market power, then markets will not deliver on aligning consumers and companies' preferences and, and, and giving you more data protection. But these laws, as I mentioned, are sophisticated laws. They, they kind of understand this. And, um, and what we know from TUV is that well-designed torts can complement markets in protecting consumers. And so if you have something like class actions or collective redress, you can help overcome information asymmetries. Like I, I, as a consumer or a person, do not know that Dupont is polluting the river next to my house, but a big class action lawyer can hire experts, can do things that will, that will sue and that generate this kind of knowledge. If you have injunctions and damages, you can make even monopolists uh, comply with the preferences of consumers by making them profitable, by ordering them to do things. And this is really effective because it maintains this decentralized monitoring and enforcement that's typical of markets. You know? It's like consumers finding something that they dislike, they sue the company, and in doing so, we don't really have to rely on the government, we just rely on the judicial system that we can put it as a sign. And what you see is that laws like the, the GDPR and the CCPA, they really create this statutory data tort. So you have a right to access, you have a right to rectification, you have a right of erasure. In Europe, you have a right to be forgotten. In, in the US, you have a right to prevent the sale of your data to any third parties. And uh, they also have provisions like the GDPR says that people are entitled to full compensation for any harms they suffered. And in the, in the California law, they're entitled to statutory damages, like that is stand, at least a minimum damage of $7,500, depending on the kind of violation that you have to kind of replen to replenish you and even more if you can prove that you've been harmed more as a way to, to ensure the market, the torts work. But, and as I said, this is a paper about, but here again, information asymmetries and market concentration can become a serious problem. So uh, even after these provisions of these laws, once you analyze them in more detail, you see that uh, important problems remain. So uh, first, if consumers uh, do not understand the terms of the trade, they do not understand exactly how well their data is being collected, how much is being collected, how it's being used, then they, if they do not understand they're being harmed, they won't sue. So the same thing that kind of prevents markets from working in the first place, in a way, it also blocks the tort regulatory system. You have in some places like the EU, you have problems with collective redress that make this even, make this even harder. And hopefully the new directive, these things will become better. And, and as countries establish these laws, they'll become better. And what, and, and what I think it makes it even worse is that when markets are so complex, it becomes very hard for the tort system to work because courts cannot either identify a harm or even if they identify a harm, they cannot link to a specific action by a specific company. So imagine that they, you can identify a data breach, but you, there have been so many data breaches that, you, that even if your identity has been stolen, a court has a very hard time saying that your identity has been stolen because Equifax was breached or because Marriott was breached at some point. And so they, if there's a, there's a problem in establishing causality. And even if you can establish causality, it's very hard to calculate damages. And so it's very hard to assign. And what you see is that in a lot of places, in the US in particular, I think in the EU as well, uh, these tort lawsuits have a, have a big issue exactly because this, the lack of cognition of harm, lack of causality, or a lot of difficulties in calculating damages. And when companies have market power, this becomes an even steeper hill to climb because they can impose contractual terms that exempt them. They can just put in their contract, we'll do anything you want with your data. Uh, that's what happened in the US because you don't have specific rights to what you can do or not. They can put class action waivers or things like these, which are harder in the EU, but they are easier in the US. They can just hire the best lawyers to defend them and drag on litigation forever and just make it extremely costly and tell them they won't settle for anything. And if you want to assume you're going to have to spend tens of millions of euros or of dollars to go to court. And, and one other thing that's interesting that consumers may also be afraid to sue. And I think we've seen this with Directive 9546, the older EU data directive, where they did a survey and a lot of consumers were just afraid of bringing these companies to court because they rely so much on Google that if Google somehow decides that they won't give them search or Gmail anymore, then they, they are much worse off than they would be just because Google is taking their data. So this is a problem with the tort system. And then third thing is that we also, but there are other alternatives. We also know from theory that regulatory enforcement is, can be the ultimate fallback mechanism. When, the, when markets don't work, torts don't work, then regulation might work. And there, there are different ways in how regulation might work. The first, the government has the power to 
coerce and to impose fines and in doing things you can tackle even the companies with the largest, even fully monopolists, uh, specialized bureaucracies like data protection agencies can demand information and in doing so diminish information symmetries and make sure they understand what's going on. And this is a very powerful process, but it's important to recognize that this process kind of removes consumers from the direct determination of quality and prices, because now regulation means that it's up to the government to set the standards to monitor compliance and to enforce the standards, become an agent of the government. And, and what is, sorry, a principle of the government as their agent. And, and what you see is that indeed the GDPR and the CCPA have a strength in enforcement. I don't think I need to say much. I think everybody understands that all these data protection authorities that are, that are expanding. And but as I mentioned, this is a, this is a paper about buts. Um, information asymmetries and market power also impact and undermine regulatory enforcement in ways that I think these laws have not anticipated. So first, uh, they completely exacerbate agency problems. So opaque, very concentrated markets are much more prone to regulatory capture than, non, than other markets, because first companies are gonna be competing spe specifically to data. Companies are competing with the government to hire the most talented data scientists that without them, they cannot really understand what's going on. And this is an unfair competition. Uh, there, there was a, uh, there was a, because these are the most uh, well-paid uh, employees in the world, there was a very interesting assessment by Brave that found that uh, pretty much no data protection authority in the EU had any data scientists. They all relied on, on lawyers and economists. I'm a lawyer and an economist. I think lawyers and economists are great, but I don't think that you can run a data protection agency just based on us. And, uh, and just this added complexity and obscurity gives you way more opportunities to ban regulations. When I'm talking about capture here, I'm not talking about uh, corruption that someone pays these regulators to to do something. I'm talking that this is an incredibly complex market that no one understands well, but the companies understand better than anyone else. So what regulators do is that they have to establish by definition a rapport with the companies to ask them what they're doing, rely on information they receive from the companies and things like this. And in this process, once they necessarily get closer, that's part of the deal, that's necessarily what they need to do, companies can then hire professors, uh, hire consultants, rely on revolving doors and things like this to ban regulations and tell them what I'm doing is either is the best thing, there's nothing else that can be done, like you cannot come after me. And, and what is worse is that in this type of markets, rent payments become much harder to identify. So if consumers don't know how much data is being extracted from them, they cannot really organize like a, a interest group to fight capture. And something that I think is particularly not really understood is how much, if you rely too much on governments to do data protection, a big chunk of the government might not have the same incentives as consumers. So uh, the intelligence community, for example, as I was mentioning, wants widespread data collection to protect uh, national security. And that's a, fair, uh, that's a fair principle. That's something they should do. But it's not clear that they are gonna have the same incentive to diminish data collection. Data can be a strategic input for many companies in this digital world. And what you see is that companies, the countries like China, a bit in the US, you're seeing more and more in the EU data policy, trying to find ways to share data to promote local players. And I think a good representation of this is Brazil. So Brazil has a new data protection authority uh, that is supposed to protect the private data of consumers. And then the Brazilian government just appointed generals as members of the data protection authority because they said, this is a too strategic area to leave it to civilians. We're gonna just have generals doing this. And, and second is that this puts a lot of pressure, information asymmetries and market power put a lot of pressure on public resources because very opaque stealth markets when combined with a very broad jurisdiction, think about Cambridge Analytica, like any company can somehow, we can discuss how, how bad is Cambridge Analytica, but I think it's easy in the mind, collect data and do things that we think are bad with it. So we, we, cannot, we don't need only to supervise dominant companies like in antitrust, we need to supervise the whole economy. And then, and so this makes it much more expensive to regulate and to oversee. And the companies with market power can really increase this cost of regulation. And the real problem here is that the system has no counterweights to prevent capture. Capture is not unavoidable. And capture is not a reason to do away with the risk of capture, to do away with any risk of, with any regulation. What you need to do is that you need to have some protections. And we don't have protections that, in data protection. So agencies are incredibly opaque. So there is no transparency. Uh, Enforcement is normally concentrated in a couple of players like Ireland, Luxembourg, uh, who ha don't have exactly the best incentives to act on behalf of everyone else. And there are no clear funding sources to a lot of these jurisdictions, so they are really like underfunded. So, so what is the idea of the paper is that why we, in theory, 
data protection laws rely on markets, on, the, on a torch regime and on regulatory enforcement to enforce their, their rules. In practice, all three have big issues. So it, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise that we see so much disconnect or they were seeing increasing disconnect between what these laws take into you and what happens in reality because you have, kind of lack this system. And then what the paper does at the end, and I'll, I'll finish here quickly, is that uh, it, it tries to look at antitrust and anti-fraud policies that face many of the similar concerns and try to see how, how they develop mechanisms to increase enforcement over time. And the focus is on diminishing information asymmetries. I, I have another paper uh, that discusses the power and competition, how much is being done by agencies, which is over there. And I'm sure you can talk to all this. He'll tell you everything. <laughs> he knows more than I do. He'll tell you everything about that. You want to know about this topic. Uh, but information asymmetries have kind of been neglected for a long time. And so what it defends is that we should be using, uh, we should be multiplying the resources uh, that we are using to do monitoring. So. Uh, and we could use a system where we aggregate fines and we distribute grants and prizes to people like NYOB, Mike Schrams, or to universities or to investigative journalist centers so that you have more eyes on the ground to try to detect violation and more sophisticated eyes who can understand what's going on. And then not only this, the system has to be designed to bring violations to light. So in antitrust, we have long been relying on leniency programs to discover cartels, for example. In anti-corporate fraud, we have whistleblower programs to discover anti-corporate violation. So we should develop a similar whistleblowing system to have insiders denounce violations of data protection laws. And then finally, because of information asymmetries, you're gonna to have to rely on some form of, um, inter you're gonna to have to rely on some form of regulation because of these problems with information asymmetries and market concentration. But if we're gonna do this, we need to have a lot of transparency and then he uses the example of Kaji, the Brazilian authority, who are all acts by the, by the public regulator are public by default. And then they have to justify whenever they, they decide to make something confidential. And then we can discuss exactly how to frame this in particular, given the necessities. But like, I think this principle that regulation should be public and then privacy is the, is the, is the exception should be the norm here. And the, but what we have is the exceptions, like everything is completely opaque. And occasionally someone decides to give an interview to the media and tell them what's going on in their internal discussions. So that's it. Sorry for going a little bit over time. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to, to the discussion and the Q&A and, and any feedback. As I mentioned, is really, feel free to send any comments you want because it's really our developing ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much.